Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our second webinar in our series showcasing California's network of underwater parks or marine protected areas. We're going to get started here today, and we just wanted to let you know that on your screen, you should see an area where you can actually chat in your questions, and if you want, you can chat your questions to Daniel Brown, and we'll be glad to address those questions at the end of our webinar. In our previous webinar, we explored California's path to marine protected areas. Today, we're going to dive into some of the basic science of marine protected areas. Here with me today, I have Dr. Mark Carr, eminent marine scientist and a former member of the science advisory team for the MLPA, and he helped to design the network of marine protected areas. And we also have Dr. Jan Freiwald, director of Reef Check California. This is a citizen science monitoring program. My name is Dr. Ricky Dunsmore, and I work on behalf of the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation, formerly known as the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Foundation. And we work to help increase awareness and support of California's underwater protected areas. Well, here's an overview of today's journey. First, we're going to look at the science, the basic science behind MPAs. Secondly, we're going to delve into the design of California's network, so the application of that science, to better understand why the MPAs are placed where we find them today. And then finally, we're going to look towards the future, and we're going to try to understand what we should expect moving forward. Well, it's important for us to recognize that marine protected areas, they're only one important part of the solution, but they're not the only tool for solving the ocean's problems. There's numerous assaults threatening our oceans. There's different solutions that tackle different threats. For instance, if you look up in the upper left-hand side, we see that marine zoning is a program that helps to guide where activities like shipping, wave, and wind energy should be located. Whereas we have water quality programs in our cities and towns that help reduce the amount of pollution that reaches our coast. We also have laws, and these protect the breeding and feeding habitats of endangered species such as the sea otter, and they're often key to ensuring the recovery of this little guy. A whole suite of fisheries regulations also govern what species, how much, and with what gear fishermen can use to target high-value species. And then finally, coastal planning, including designating places like marine protected areas, are another part of the solution. So what is a marine protected area, or an MPA? Some people like to refer to MPAs as underwater parks like our state parks or Yosemites of the sea. They're really just special places that receive added protection. Many of these MPAs or underwater parks, they're located offshore from protected areas on land, like in this image at Point Lobos State Natural Reserve. On the right-hand side, we see the land is protected, and offshore, we see that the waters are protected. The design is quite simple. Just place some special parts of the ocean off limits to destructive activities and give those special places a chance to recover and rebound. This image shows how a marine protected area is supposed to work. If you look at the left hand side, you have an image of an unprotected area. This is open where all types of activities can occur. On the right hand side is an MPA. This is where some harmful activities are restricted. What do you notice that's different between the left-hand side and the right-hand side? Well, you should notice at least three things. On the right, there's larger animals, larger individuals, right? You also see that you have more abundant individuals. There's more of them. And then finally, there's more different kinds of species. This is what scientists call biodiversity. In a nutshell, what this is showing us is that if we leave the ocean alone, she can and does restore herself. So having places like those on the right-hand side set aside as reservoirs or hope spots for our future will be increasingly important as we face global threats like climate change. 
One thing that's often confusing about marine protected areas is the term itself, MPA. That's because actually there's many different flavors or different types of marine protected areas. The term MPA, it's a general term. It's like an umbrella term. It just means a place that has some added protection. This graphic goes a little ways towards explaining what we're talking about here. If you look at the far left-hand side, you're looking at one type of marine protected area called a marine reserve. This is the most restrictive type of MPA, where most extractive activities are not allowed. If you move over to the right-hand side, you see that you have increasing types of activities, typically by humans, that are occurring. If you look at the far right-hand side, this is a multiple-use area, where things like fishing and diving and exploitation can occur. Marine protected areas of all types, though, have been working and are working around the world. There are many, many examples of success. They are working in different oceans, they work across different species, and they work in different habitats from the Arctic to the tropics. In places like Kenya, they're actually providing revenue from ecotourism, and this is providing um, local dollars for local communities. In places like the Philippines, there's actually research that shows that catches of fish nearby protected areas are higher. And some recent research that has come out of Baja, uh, Mexico, is showing that marine protected areas may serve as places where populations are actually more resilient to unforeseen natural disasters. This was shown with abalone in Baja. The point is, is that the benefits of marine protected areas are varied. We see ecological benefits, economic benefits, and even social and cultural benefits. But the proof is overwhelming that around the world, marine protected areas can and are working. Well, now we're going to hear from Mel the Weird Fish. This is a character who's brought to us by National Geographic, and he's going to explain what marine reserves this is the most restrictive type of marine protected area can do for our ocean. You, if you bear with us for one minute, we're going to share this with you on our screen right now. Our oceans are teeming with all kinds of life. They're great and small. Not so colorful, very simple, and very weird. There's more plant life, there's coral. There's when you said very weird, an arrow pointed at me. Right. So, um, wait, what's your name? Mel, but my friends call me Mel. They, they call me Mel. Hey, Mel. Okay, Mel, if you could just step aside. I'm here today to talk about. Marine Reserve. Oh, I live in a marine reserve. It's awesome. Check it out. I got tons of fish plants. I got a place to live. I got, we got plant life. Well, you found this area didn't look quite like this 10 years ago. No. 10 years ago, this exact area looked like this. <laughs> wow. What changed thing? It became a marine reserve. No, fishermen. Yeah, it's great for you and your friends, but it also helps the fishing community. Helps the fishing community. Also helps the fishing community. Getting fish Yeah, also helps the fishing community. How about I just finish what I was trying to say? Well, here are the top three benefits of marine reserves. Number one, it protects biodiversity, allowing the ocean to replenish itself, develop a healthier ecosystem which raises a wider range of species, a lot of which are delicious. Though the increase biomass, a healthier ecosystem raises healthier fish. Yeah. On average, the total biomass of fish in the reserve increases 450%. And number three, spillover. Because the reserves are heavily populated, lots of dopey fish are 
So that's an excellent little video that uh, actually explains a lot of the key principles of what a marine protected area is. Um, one of the things that that really shows um, is that marine protected areas, they're very different than other tools in the toolbox. And one of the reasons for that is that they um, protect multiple species and the habitats that those species depend on. They protect places like spawning areas, nursery areas, and feeding areas, all of which are important pieces of the puzzle. Let's see. No, okay. Um, which are all important parts, pieces of the puzzle, rather than what traditional fisheries management does, which typically manages species by species. So we all recall that there's rules for salmon fishing, there might be rules for halibut fishing, but a marine protected area actually protects a place and it protects all of the plants and animals that live in that place. Well, data from around the world shows what we can expect in terms of positive changes within marine protected areas. Like we saw in the video, biomass, that's just the weight of all the plants and animals, can be up to more time, more than four times larger in marine protected areas. The number of animals on average in an area often triples, and the number of species is almost double that found in places that do not have added protection. The take home message from all of this is that in well enforced marine protected areas, we can expect large, long lasting increases in many key measures of population health. In addition to those key measures increasing, something that's really interesting, turns out that fish are very different from humans when it comes to breeding. Apparently in many species of fish, the older, fatter females are actually much more important to reproduction than the younger, smaller fish. If we look at this graphic and you look to the left-hand top side, you can see that the average number of eggs that are produced by a 14-inch rockfish is about 150,000. However, if you protect that fish inside a marine protected area, let her grow up another 10 inches, she actually produces an average of 1.7 million eggs. This is a concept that's given a funny term called BOF, or big old fertile female fish. And who do we typically target as fishermen? That's right, the large ones, which is why marine protected areas can translate into more fish for the future and ultimately, more fishing for the future. The way that marine protected areas can work for fishermen is through something that we call spillover. If you have an area open to fishing, so if you look at the left-hand side of this graphic, and an area closed off to harvest on the right-hand side, the organisms inside the protected area can grow in number and size. As the number of these fish increase inside the protected area, 
Some of these will actually move outside the boundary. This is what we call spillover. But the amount of that spillover varies depending on the species. If you think about the amount of time that a particular fish may spend inside versus outside the protected area, look at the right-hand side and think about the differences in movement between those species. So how often would you expect to find a clownfish like Nemo outside the marine protected area? Very little, or perhaps 0%. That's because his home range is fairly small. The clownfish is likely to be find, found at all times inside a very small marine protected area. Whereas a great white shark, on the other hand, is likely to be found roaming outside the boundaries of the protected area, perhaps up to 99% of the time. Their, their home range can span ocean basins. And if we look in the middle, something like a rockfish, however, is more likely to benefit from the protection of a marine protected area. I want to point out these numbers are just hypothetical. Even within a species, some individual fishes move more than others. Think of the curious teenager who's exploring new boundaries compared to an older fish who'd rather stay at home. The point is, is that through spillover, marine, prote marine protected area benefits not only happen inside the boundaries, but actually export, bound export benefits outside. Here's, here's another way to look at how movement determines how well an MPA protects a species. Because species vary greatly in how far they move, changes in marine protected area size will determine how many species are protected. For example, MPAs on the order of 10 kilometers will protect some rockfish and surf perch, like we see here. If we expand that area, we'll protect more species, whereas some species move so much that only by protecting entire oceans would you encompass the whole range of their movement. However, these far-ranging species can benefit by protecting smaller areas where they feed and breed. Most marine animals do use more than one habitat during their lives, as we see here in this species of rockfish, a boccaccio, that's moving onshore and offshore throughout its life. They release huge numbers of tiny young into the open ocean, and these, these larvae potentially travel far away from their origin. Some young may stay within the boundaries of the marine protected area, while others may settle far away and this provides benefits from protection in distant areas. So what should we expect once we protect a place? Well, the answer to that question depends on a number of factors, and they're listed here on the right-hand side. First, it depends on whether or not a place was harvested before protection. If a place that wasn't exploited becomes protection, would we really expect to see much of a change? Probably not. Secondly, what we expect would depend on the species. Some species aren't targeted by fishing, right? In the image above, we see that the number of sheephead, lingcod, and rockfish, they're all higher inside the protected area, this area in red. But if you look at the bottom right-hand graph, that's the senorita, that's a species that actually isn't protected. And we see that the senorita you wouldn't expect to see the same response to protection. In addition, things like habitat characteristics will influence the response to protection. If we protect a place that's highly degraded or polluted, we wouldn't expect the same recovery to be from someplace else that's pristine. It may also depend on interactions among species. For example, at first you might see declines in some species as predators rebound in an area and they start to prey on organisms inside the protected area. And finally, it should, we should expect recovery to depend on how much added protection there is at a particular location. Remember, marine protected areas, or MPAs, are a very broad term, and their level of protection can vary from place to place. Some marine protected areas are fully protected, whereas others allow some types of potentially damaging activities. So what we expect will correspond to a variety of these um, attributes that we're showing here on the right. 
So now let's shift gears and focus in on California specifically. We've all learned a little bit about the science used to drive the design of the California network. And now I'm going to hand it over to Mark Carr, who's going to walk us through this piece by piece, as he was an intimate part of the MLPA design. Mark? Thanks, Ricky. Uh, so if you recall from the last webinar, the Marine Life Protection Act, or MLPA as it's referred to, was a landmark piece of marine conservation legislation that was passed in 1999. That law provided California with a mandate to create a statewide network of marine protected areas across state waters between the borders of Mexico to Oregon. The act was passed to achieve several key goals, including and primarily the protection of California's marine biodiversity, the ecosystems that support that biodiversity, and representative and unique habitats where each of those ecosystems are found. Sort of a Noah's Ark idea, the collecting of all the different species in the system. And in addition, it was hoped that, that the network would ensure future recreational and research opportunities. The MLPA initiative process was established to work with the managing agency, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, to design this statewide network. And the act itself required that the best available science would be used to create the network, using the input in addition and advice of resource managers, ocean users, including fishers, and scientists. So to that end, a team of scientific experts from various fields of research, ecology, genetics, oceanography, fisheries, were brought together from universities both across the state and beyond to come up with science guidelines. And then over the course of many years, those science guidelines were applied along the entire coast by regional stakeholder groups with local knowledge of ocean users, recreational and commercial fishermen, business owners, and anyone who had a strong interest in how the coast was managed. So to achieve the goal of protecting representative habitats, one of the first science objectives for the science advisory team was to identify the various habitats and associated ecosystem that supports the state's marine biodiversity. So the science advisory team identified about 14 different habitats, including rocky reefs and areas of sandy bottom, each at different depth zones, because we know that from the intertidal to the offshore border of state waters, those rocky reefs and sandy bottoms support very different ecosystems at different depths but it also included iconic habitats like the kelp forest, submarine canyons, the open ocean, the estuarine environment, and, and others, um, all to be included in that network of MPAs. But one of the things that we learned from recent surveys is that communities and species um, supported by an ecosystem, like a kelp forest, for example, varies along the coastline. So, for example, if you look at that image uh, on, the, on the right, um, it shows two major biogeographic regions along the coast of California. You'll notice that where they um, merge is a, uh, in the area of Point Conception. And so, for example, the kelp forest south of Point Conception along the southern, uh, coast of Southern California support very different reef fishes than those kelp forests to the north. So you see things like sheephead and Garibaldi and kelp bass, giant sea bass, inhabiting kelp forests to the south, whereas the kelp forests to the north are largely um, inhabited by various species of rockfish. But we've also found, based on surveys, that even within each of those biogeographic regions, there's distinct regions that support different communities associated with those kelp for us. So this image on the, on the left, um, on the coast of Southern California, shows points that are sites where kelp forest and rocky intertidal communities were surveyed. And then these five different colored ellipses um, identify these five distinct regions 
that support different kinds of communities in both the kelp forest and the rocky intertidal. Therefore, if you want to protect all the species that are supported by the different ecosystems in Southern California, it was required that, each, that MPAs be distributed across each of these five different regions. So the next major objective was to determine how large each individual MPA should be. And this was determined largely by the distance or range of movement of individual fishes. Recognizing as the, in that figure, that table that Ricky showed earlier, that there are some species that simply move way too much to be protected by a coastal MPA. For example, salmon, sharks, tuna, that range up and down the entire coast. But analyses of fish home ranges, especially work that was done by Jan Freiwald, who we're going to hear from later in this webinar, indicated that many of the near shore species, especially the rocky reef associated species, move less than half a mile over their lifetime. So using that information, the size guidelines for the MPAs um, were to be required to be at least 9 to 18 square miles, preferably 18 to 36 square miles, and also importantly to extend from the near shore out to the state waters, the state border um, into deep water offshore, which would allow fish to move up and down those depth zones and remain protected within, within the MPA. So having identified the habitats and how large each MPA should be, the next element of a network is the spacing between the adjacent MPAs with each of the habitat types um, identified within each MPA. This is the real network aspect of, of the system, right, where MPAs are actually connected to one another by the movement of young that are typically referred to as larvae in marine organisms. And so to, deter to determine how far larvae are transported, um, in other words, to determine how far these MPAs should be separated from one another, we relied largely on genetic information that indicates how many individuals were being transported from one population along the coast to another. And then these analyses suggested that the space, that, that the MPA should be spaced on the order of 31 to 62 miles apart from one another. Um, and this would ensure that young could move from one marine protected area to the next and therefore um, the basis, the real basis of the network idea. So using these and other science guidelines, the groups of stakeholders from each of the four, regional, four regions along the coast then generated proposals of networks for their regions. And those proposals best balanced meeting the science guidelines with the greatest consensus among the stakeholders and those were forwarded by the forward for consideration by the Fish and Game Commission. And the product is a statewide network that spans the coast again from Oregon to Baja with 124 MPAs. Approximately 9% of state waters fill in no take marine reserves. Um, and then an additional 7% were placed in what are called state marine conservation areas that allow limited recreational or commercial fishing. So that leads to a total of about 16% of state waters were set aside in the protected areas. As a consequence, it's the largest science-based network of marine protected areas in the world and sets the state of California as one of the forerunners of marine conservation. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we're all really fortunate to have Mark here, who dedicated a large portion of his career um, to actually designing uh, this network for California. So now that we uh, have the marine protected areas, we know how they, they were designed and some of the science behind those, now we're going to look towards the future and see what we have in store for California. And to do that, I'm going to hand it over to Jan Freiwald who's a scientist at UC Santa Cruz and also the director of Reef Check California. Jan? Thank you, Ricky. So ecosystem monitoring is key for California's MPA. Monitoring is accomplished 
through partnerships that are led by the monitoring, MPA monitoring enterprise. And through groups such as PSCO, ReefCheck, or the collaborative fisheries research groups, fishermen, citizen scientists, and university researchers work together to collect ecological information inside and out of the MPA. Those baseline studies are being conducted in every region where MPAs were established, and then these are followed by long-term monitoring studies to evaluate how well the network of MPA, MPAs performs over time. Literally hundreds of studies are being conducted within the California MPAs, providing critical information for what the future holds. So when designing and implementing ecosystem monitoring of MPAs, we need to know what signs to look for and what we would expect to see if, um, if ecosystems are improving after protection. And as Ricky pointed out, we would expect to see larger individuals, more of them, and we would also expect to see intact food webs in which all players are present, including producers, prey, and predators. But when looking at the results of monitoring studies, it's important to set our expectations realistically. Recovery will take time. For example, if a park was set aside in Africa to protect elephants, would you expect the number of elephants to double in a year or two? No, and that's because we know that elephants take time to mature and give birth. And the same is true in the ocean for many species, as shown in, in this image on the top. Each species differs, and some grow quickly, mature at a young age, and produce large numbers of babies, for example, scallops or squid, all the way on the left in this graph. These animals may multiply rapidly in marine reserves and become much more abundant. But in contrast, other species, such as rockfish or halibut, may take 10 to 15 years to mature, meaning that conservation benefits will take time to be detected. We also know that not all species will increase in size or numbers, but that there will be interactions between the species as they recover. Given sufficient time, such as in the Channel Islands MPAs, which have been protected for over 30 years now, there will be cascading effects throughout the ecosystem. For example, after many years of protection, the reserve, shown on the left-hand side here on this slide, has many more lobster. And these lobsters feed on urchins, allowing the kelp to grow. Compare this to a fished area shown on the right, where urchins are much more abundant. The urchins graze the kelp, which is bad news for many of the other kelp forest species. So this shows the importance of time in recovery in MPAs, and that the changes in each species will um, cascade through the food web, resulting in ecosystem-wide changes and benefits of the MPA. But there's not only scientific evidence and economic science of, of recovery, we also hear these anecdotal stories about how MPAs are working. This is a quote from Jim Webb, a recreational fisherman who participated in a study that catches and releases fish in selected protected areas to evaluate their progress. And Jim was amazed, stating that it was breathtaking to see the water column literally stacked with fish. The density was so great, it was difficult to get your tackle anywhere near the bottom. Every hook in the water caught a fish. And we had to stop fishing to let the scientists catch up with the tagging. So, so overall, there are many positive signs for recovery in California's MPAs. And results from recent studies demonstrate that many of the older MPAs are showing positive trends with increasing numbers of large fish. In many places, rockfish are recovering, but the results also demonstrate that recovery will take time. Nevertheless, the trends are encouraging. If you look to the graph on the right, you notice that there are many more red bars on the right-hand side which indicates that species that are fished are increasing inside MPAs over time. Lobster another, is another example of commercially and recreationally important species that are increasing in MPAs. And other harvested invertebrates such as abalone show positive signs as well. Thank you, Jan. That was an excellent synopsis of what we can expect as California's marine protected areas recover. So this remember when slide, um, we've all seen pictures like this. These are halibut that were caught from hook and line in Monterey during the 1940s. And while we may never get back to an ocean that looks exactly like this, 
we can move in that direction, and that's exactly what we hope that we're doing by putting in place protections such as MPAs. There's many other factors affecting the ocean, and MPAs can address just some of these threats. But with protection, many species and habitat can and will recover. So in summary, what did we learn today? Here's just a few of the take home messages that we hope you get out of today. First, we learned that marine protected areas are an effective tool. They have worked and they are working in places and circumstances for many different purposes around the world. Secondly, we learned that the marine protected areas in California, our marine protected area network, it's on the right track. It's on a positive track. And scientific monitoring, both from citizen science and from research from places like UCSC and Stanford and other universities across the state, are showing us that the positive trends of recovery are occurring, especially in places that have been in place for a long time, like Point Lobos and the Channel Islands. So we're also learning patience. Recovery takes time. That's because we know that many species take years to mature. But places like Point Lobos offer a glimpse of a bright future for California. And then finally, monitoring will be key and essential to revealing the positive benefits and the trade-off of California's hard work and sacrifice. We hope that you've enjoyed today's webinar, and Mark and Jan will now, and I will now join in fielding any questions that you have on the science of marine protected areas. If anybody has any questions, please write them in to Danielle or raise your hand in the WebEx and we'll be glad to address those to the best that we can. There's also a website here. For more information, you can visit www.californiamcas.org. This is a website that has many of the um, education and outreach materials that are used across the state. It has many of the research and monitoring publications and documents that um, we referred to today, including a, a great little appendix that's the science of marine reserves. There's also a summary of the Channel Islands marine reserves, um, their monitoring results. All of those can be downloaded from the web. And if there aren't any questions, feel free to contact us in the future. Okay, we do have one question. Danielle, did you want to repeat that for us, please? The question is, has there been any research that indicates that spillover is indeed happening? You know, maybe this is Mark Carr, and I'll um, give an initial response to that or answer to that question. You know, one of the better examples that I'm aware of is lobster in uh, the Channel Islands. Those marine protected areas have been around um, longer than the majority of the MLPA network. But um, in that system, they've definitely seen a uh, spillover of, of lobsters, larger lobsters moving uh, out of the MPA. Another question. Okay. We have another question. Hold on. What is the likelihood that the number or size of MPAs will increase thereby taking up more of the coast? Um, again, this, this and is related to that. What is, is it possible to recommend new areas for an MPA? Uh, this is Mark Corrigan. You know, again, that's more of a policy question. Um, but nonetheless, I, I think it's comfortable to say, to say that um, I don't think there'll be any changes, especially any increases in marine reserves or, or marine protected areas, until the performance or the effectiveness of uh, the existing MPAs have been assessed and demonstrate that, in fact, they're doing, they're achieving their their uh, policy goals. Do we have any other questions from the audience? We hear, 
This is, um, we hear a lot about urchin barrens here on the North Coast. Do you think there is any scientific basis to this theory? Sure. Okay, we're going to hand it to Mark Carr, who's going to answer the question about urchin barrens. Um, so, so the idea, the, que uh, the way I understand the question is whether um, there is evidence that urchins create barrens. Certainly in Southern California, there's evidence that um, barrens are created. When there's outbreaks in the abundance of, of sea urchins, they'll actually create fronts and move through an area um, at re removing all the algae in a local area. So it's likely that, especially on the North Coast where um, there are not any sea otters that are one of the most voracious predators on sea urchins, the local densities, which is the number of individuals per area, of sea urchins certainly can get to the point where they're actually creating barren areas. Okay, we, have another question. we have another question, Daniel. Have there been any counterintuitive, unexpected results from the established MPAs? And what's the most critical, unanswered question that begs for research? Oh, that's an excellent question. Mark? Um, yeah, good question. So, boy, you know, off the top, so I, I should mention, um, and I think Ricky may have mentioned this earlier, that both Jan and I have been involved in a lot of the baseline characterization studies um, in at least the central, the north central um, coast, and I think Jan's involved in the south coast as well. And uh, and so we are pretty uh, intimately familiar with the, the monitoring data that's been generated to date. And I, I frankly don't know of any, uh, what I would say, counterintuitive results yet. Um, I think, frankly, uh, uh, it's so early to be seeing either intuitive or counterintuitive results that it'll probably take a little longer for those to manifest. Oh, and then the other question was, uh, you know, what are some of the, the most important um, lines of research? Uh, you know, I think that one of the key um, lines of research and one of the greatest challenges that hopefully California, having established themselves as sort of global leaders in the design of networks, will start to um, develop approaches to actually assess how effective the network is, not, not just individual MPAs. There's lots of studies that have been conducted to, that assess you know, the, the response of populations within an MPA relative to outside. But the key thing that sets the MLPA apart from other parts of the world is that it was really based as a network. And so the critical thing there is to, to evaluate whether the, the system of MPAs along the coast are actually operating as a network. And, and one way to, to rephrase that is, you know, is, the, is the whole network more than simply the sum of the individual MPAs? Is there some synergistic um, or emergent um, result of creating a network that actually cranks up regional populations along the coast more than we would see um, with just separate independent MPAs. And so developing models that use the monitoring data that we're collecting on the size of fish, the number of fish, the production of their larvae along the coast, both in and out of the MPAs, to really figure, to assess the, the state of those populations will be critical, I think, for really nailing down these network questions. Thank you, Mark. Danielle? Um, we have another question that um, would like to address the results that some studies have shown that unless the MPA is a no-take, there's not much benefit. And um, on that note, what does research show on ecological benefits of no-take versus less restrictive MPAs? Yeah, I don't know that those results have been generated at all from the California MPAs. I, I assume that, that you, uh, the, the uh, question refers to um, comparisons that have been made elsewhere. 
Um, and I frankly don't know. You know, obviously there's going to be effects um, or differences between strictly no take and partial take depending on the species and whether it's included in the partial take or not. Um, but I don't know how much evidence there is, um, and certainly I'm not familiar with evidence on the coast of California for the relative differences between um, no, strictly no-take and conservation areas. Um, there's another question. I'm not sure if you all have the answer, but it's, can a waiver be issued <laughs> to cull purple sea urchins from Avalone Cove in Southern California? Can you ask that again, Daniel? Um, can a waiver be issued to cull pur purple sea urchins from Abalone Cove in Southern California? Okay. Uh, this is Mark again, and you know that's that is a, um, a question that the the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife has to answer. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I, that's certainly nothing that uh, or not a question that. Um, that any of us on this um, webinar can we answer. we can help direct you. We can provide some follow up materials to specific questions. Um, you have our contact information, and we actually have a tree that shows the contact information for the different divisions of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and can direct you to their website as well to make sure you get an answer to that question. We have another question. Um, are SMRs, state marine reserves, adequ adequately enforced to realize optimal results? And I think that question is, this is Ricky Dunsmore, um, that question, you know, is likely dependent on the location. Um, there are some programs that are out there, um, citizen watch programs like MPA watch that are actually evaluating, um, you know, the activities that are occurring within the marine protected areas. And there's a lot of NGOs and partners um, out there who are doing education and outreach to try to inform people that these marine protected areas do in fact exist. Um, and signage, there's currently a statewide signage project that's actually trying to uh, place signage statewide so that people are um, you know, aware that these places are out there. In a lot of cases, you know, the public simply doesn't know that these MPAs exist and that's part of what we're here doing today is trying to educate you and create these webinars, but they're also being recorded so that you can go back to your city councils, your planning offices, your schools, and actually give these presentations to a wider audience so that we begin to make Californians both proud and aware of what we've accomplished in this state. If there's no other questions, I think we're going to thank you all for joining us and um, abide by your time. We know that you're all very busy people. And like we said, this is the second webinar in the series of three. The first one sort of covered the basics of the policy of California's MLPA. That was recorded. And today's Science of Marine Protected Areas was also recorded. We hope that you'll join us on June 23rd. This will be uh, given by Mike Sutton and uh, Nicole Lampy of Resource Media, a public relations um, firm in San Francisco, and it's going to focus on communicating about marine protected areas. All of these webinars are being recorded. We'd love to share them with you for your use in your individual meetings in your local areas. So please get in touch with us in the future. If you had any technical difficulties, we apologize. Um, and please reach out to Danielle or myself in the future. I'd really like to thank both Mark Carr and Jan Freiwald for taking time out of their schedule as well. And we hope you all enjoy a lovely day. <laughs>